Ladies and gentlemen, let's get game into the com video. Despite the doom and gloom of Moore's Law, and obviously this is primarily down to the shrinking of die processors, and this is also affecting Intel right now. We've heard about their yield issues and how even Cannon Lake is going to be slowed down simply because of this. TSMC, on the other hand, are on a bit of a roll. Uh, by the second half of 2016, they're going to start producing 10NM processors. The 10NM FinFET will have 110 to 120% higher transistor density compared to 16NM, and this also translates to 15% higher clock frequency potential if it uses the same amount of power as now, whereas on the other hand, if they opt to go with the same frequency, you're going to be able to enjoy 35% less power consumption. Now, as I said, it's going to be the second half of 2016 that this sucker is going to start entering production, but it's not going to hit store shelves, and you're not going to have to buy anything until at least 2017. So that's actually kind of cool, but things aren't 100% rosy. Currently, TSMC's 16nm FinFET is actually more along the lines of 20nm, so if you continue to look at the scaling, 10nm should be on par with Intel's 14nm. Now, that's to say that it doesn't really make that much difference. I mean, at the end of the day, as long as the chip improves, I don't think many people, aside from the super duper tech enthusiasts and potentially, you know, the companies that are looking for production are really going to care about this. But let's face it, what they're going to say is Intel got beat to 10nm. They won't really care about the gate pitch, FinFET pitch, or any of that stuff. And from a technical point of view, the end customer is just going to care about seeing 10nm. It's the ooh shiny factor. Does it make a much difference? Well, to be honest with you, from GPU point of view, from CPU point of view, and so on, it's just an improvement. And as I've said previously, we are starting to hit the point where it's very, very difficult for manufacturers to sh start shrinking things down. I mean, back in the day, things were like 150, 130, and even 90, you know, 90, uh, 45 even was not too bad. But since then, since even, let's say, 32, 28, it started to be a bit of a pain in the buttocks from Intel, a AMD, even NVIDIA. I mean, NVIDIA have had problems as well. As There was a reason that Maxwell didn't get the die shrink that many people expected and hoped for. Some people expected it to be on 16nm and they just couldn't do it. I'm sure they would love to have because, let's face it, from the point of view of a GPU, if you can shrink things down, you can potentially put in more stream processors, you can potentially put in more ROPs or a larger cache or what have you. Or, better still, well, not necessarily better still, you could also, of course, add in additional clock speed, or you could run it at lower power consumption, and this is very important. Let's say you're running a 300-watt PS uh, GPU, just rounding it up, and you can reduce that by 30%. That makes quite a lot of difference. It reduces heat output quite a bit, which also potentially will reduce the size of, say, the even the GPU's cooler. Not to mention the fact that this actually has a positive impact on laptops or any other type of device where size matters. To be honest with you, from a point of view of size on GPUs and so on, I don't really care. What I do care about is increased performance and reduced power consumption because at the end of the day, I don't necessarily want to be pointing a camera at the thing and I wouldn't really be able to tell things, you know, the difference between pointing it at the CPU and, say, or a pool of lava. The bottom line, it's kind of sucky The Silicon's doing this to us, but unfortunately it's just how things have been. And as we know, this is kind of a longer story, but the Gigahertz race was kind of the same thing. Intel naturally were pushing up the clock speeds, but for power leakage and other constraints, they just couldn't keep doing it. And so that's one of the reasons that the Pentium 4 just didn't hit the clock speeds that they expected. Intel were really hoping that they'd be able to at least double kind of the clock speeds that were final to the chip, and they just didn't manage to do that. This is why we're starting to see a lot of multi-processor scaling at the moment, which does have some benefits, and not all of the stuff is 100% linked, and it's not necessarily 100% cause and effect, but 
this is just where we are with computing right now. Things have to be shrunk down. Um, and the levels of complexity that we're starting to deal with on these very small processes, these very small nodes, there are, as I said yesterday, yield issues. So, for example, in Intel's case with, let's say, Skylake, um, or let's say Canon Lake, actually, you don't want a situation where you're producing a thousand chips and 50% of them, just for the sake of argument, are basically toasters. They just don't run at a good frequency. Now, obviously, sometimes this is where speed binning does come into the fact, or let's say you can release a chip which has fewer stream processes enabled, or fewer cores enabled, or less cache, and if they notice a lot of patterns with this, they could potentially release new models, lower end models, which is definitely a good way to go. I think yield is going to definitely be a problem. Um, so hopefully we can start seeing some really nice improvements on, well, everything over the next couple of years. Because 20nm has been a bit of a pain, while 20, and by 20 I'm also encompassing 28 in this as well. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll uh, see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.